Good evening. My name's Evan and welcome to Rockland Graves. I had wanted to get this video out prior to Evil Dead Rise's release, but I had to delay it unfortunately, so now we're circling back to Evil Dead 2013. Following Army of Darkness in 1992, fans were foaming at the mouth for more Ash Williams, and during a Reddit AMA in April 2011, Bruce Campbell himself teased an upcoming remake in which he would return as a producer and also... The Milkman. Oh. The news that Campbell would not be returning to the role of Ash Williams was much to the chagrin of many Evil Dead fans, for obvious reasons. Ash became iconic for being the badass with the chainsaw hand and the groovy one-liners, so his absence would surely be felt. Campbell assured fans that the remake would kick ass, and it was officially announced in July 2011 with Fede Alvarez taking on his first feature-length directorial role. Along with Bruce Campbell, Sam Raimi and Robert Tappert returned as producers, and while that was enough to make fans feel more comfortable about this new entry, it was the first time that Raimi wasn't behind the camera or intimately involved with the script. Fede Alvarez co-wrote the script with Roto Saiegez, and it was then translated to English and had some adjustments made for American audiences by Diablo Cody, as English was not the first language of the writers. Before I get into it, I want to talk about where this movie sits in the Evil Dead timeline. Initially, it was described as a remake, so it's fair to assume that this is a self-contained reimagining of the original movie. However, in the years following its release, Campbell, Raimi, Tappert, and Alvarez have all said that this is not a remake, but it takes place many years after the original movie, so it's actually just a sequel. Is this the first requel? After its approximate 20 year slumber, The Evil Dead's comeback was a financial success, but is it a black sheep in a series that stands out as one of the most consistently high quality franchises in horror? Let's take a look. This ambiguous sequel establishes itself right away as a darker take on a franchise which had become more comedy than horror. Now look at this, the foggy woods, spooky atmosphere, I love it. Evil Dead 2 and Army of Darkness leaned heavily into humor, especially the latter. So it makes sense for this movie to make it very clear right off the bat that it's going for something different to properly set expectations. We begin with an injured young woman walking through the forest seemingly in a daze. Yeah, she made a Reddit post saying she likes Halloween ends. That's a risky move. She tries to hide, but these two saw Michael in the trailer and they wanted Michael, so they knock her out and take her back to your average subreddit meetup. In reality, this opening scene is actually an interesting misdirection. It turns out that this girl is possessed by a deadite and these kind folks brought her back to the cabin to find out which of the multitude of deadite killing options will be the most fun. When she realizes the fake pleading isn't getting her anywhere, the gloves come off. <laughs> She sounds like a 14-year-old in a Call of Duty lobby five minutes after their parents leave the house. She's doused in gasoline, set ablaze, and given the same treatment the writers of Scream 6 gave to the rest of the movie when they revealed the killers. I love you, baby. It's a decent opening scene, but it's almost wholly unrelated to the rest of the movie. It happened in the same cabin, but that's about it. This is a trend in horror that I'm very glad isn't as prevalent anymore. These aren't even named characters, and it's a bit of a shame because I'm actually pretty interested in the backstory here. Why were the father and daughter out here? Who are these people, and where did they find a witch? It's undercooked, and at the end of the day, it's pretty pointless, but it does establish the tone of the movie very well. As is tradition, our characters are driving through the mountains to a cabin, and if the cabin in the original movie wouldn't immediately have you turning around to find a motel with the smallest pool of cum in the corner as possible, the one in this movie certainly will. This was the first time that an Evil Dead movie was shot outside of America, and finding the proper location was imperative to getting the tone right. The cabin was built in the aptly named Woodhill Forest in New Zealand, and it's an incredible location. The surrounding forestry is perfect and it's used effectively throughout the film, lending itself very well to that otherworldly, isolated feeling that's a big part of these movies. There was a second cabin built in a studio close to central Auckland, which was used for scenes that would benefit from a more controlled environment. The basement set was only built in the studio cabin, it was a separate piece that required the upper floor to be lifted and then put back down afterwards. This allowed more seamless shooting when characters were going from one floor to another. This is really impressive filmmaking, and it's very much in the spirit of a franchise which has shown a serious dedication to a very genuine style of production. The score is really simple, and it's not a particularly standout soundtrack, but I do really appreciate the creepy piano motifs that sneak up every once in a while. Very eerie. I'm into it. 
Let's meet the characters. David and his girlfriend Natalie are the last to arrive at the cabin and they're greeted by Olivia and Eric. The Evil Dead movies have always had a bit of a silly undertone to them, if I want to put it lightly, but as I've said before, that's not what this movie was going for. I'm all for having a darker tone, but the problem with this movie taking itself a bit more seriously than the other entries is the dialogue is pretty rough. And that's our irresistibly charming Eric. He's teaching high school, finally turned you into a bitter old coot, huh? No. You did. When cheesy dialogue is in cheesy movies, it fits. It doesn't clash with the tone, and it can actually be a pretty good draw for some viewers. When subpar writing is in a movie that takes itself more seriously, it's a lot more noticeable, and that's something this movie really does suffer from. Let's be honest, you're not coming to an Evil Dead movie for believable and interesting human interaction. It doesn't kill the experience, but it does hinder it a bit. Eric is a teacher, Olivia is a nurse, and Natalie is around. Somewhere. Sometimes. Grandpa is a more significant character than Natalie. Mia is the last of the characters we'll be meeting in this movie, and she presents a pretty interesting angle for this movie to take. In past entries, the group staying at the cabin was doing it just for a fun weekend getaway, and there was nothing more to it. We needed an excuse to get them there, and from that point on, that faded into the background. You see, Mia is a recovering heroin addict who's tried many different things to get clean, but has ultimately been unable to kick the habit, so a group of her friends, along with her brother David, have agreed to go somewhere isolated with her where she will quit cold turkey and just wait out the withdrawal. The cabin was owned by David and Mia's deceased mother, so it actually makes sense that they would choose this spot for the detox. It's a known place for Mia that likely has a lot of good memories baked into it. This is a pretty interesting premise, and it actually does play into the film's story, so kudos for doing something inventive. David finds that the cabin was broken into, but whoever it was seems to be long gone, so he feels safe enough to have a conversation with Mia about their mother that sounds like it was written in 10 minutes by a stoned kid in English class who forgot to do his homework. By the time Mom got bad, I had just gotten the job at the garage in Chicago. Maybe you were lucky. Not to see her the way that I did. I do feel like I'm being a bit too harsh on the writing. It's not great, don't get me wrong, but there are things about these characters that need to be established so we can get to the Evil Dead stuff quickly, so I can kind of understand why this is such a forced conversation. It's a somewhat necessary evil to clear up their relationship and history to give a proper backdrop to the movie without interfering with the things that fans come to these movies to see. And trust me, this movie delivers where it fucking counts. I can't stand that fucking smell anymore! Hang down, okay? <laughs> Someone must be cooking with Parmesan. I get it, Mia. Anyway, yeah, withdrawal is not so fun, but hey, at least the clock from the first movie gets a cameo. And while we're at it, so does Sam Raimi's car. Neat. Grandpa's hoping to find a Hills Have Eyes poster in the basement, but all that's found downstairs is a bunch of dead cats, evidence of arson, torture tools, and a book wrapped in barbed wire. Just something burnt here. Yeah, no, thanks, movie. I think we could have pieced that together on our own. This shot is Ash's weekend starter pack. We all know where this is going, and Eric is the one who ultimately says those magic words. Kunda. You'd think people who study this kind of thing would be a little more apprehensive about reading Latin from books bound in flesh, but apparently not. Mia's outside trying to compose herself, and the Girl Scouts show up just on time with some wonderful mint cookies to help her ground herself. Not sure how I feel about the new uniforms, but I'm sure the cookies are still just as good. On that note, Mia decides she can't be out here anymore and asks David to take her home, but earlier on, the group agreed that no matter what, they would not be letting Mia leave and she'd have to wait the whole thing out. This is the biggest reason I like the addiction angle. It creates a tangible reason for Mia's friends to not believe her when things start happening. It makes sense that they don't leave right away, it makes sense that they don't believe what she's saying, and it adds a lot of tension for the viewer. I think they could have gone a little further with it, like having her actually hallucinate things so that when a real threat presents itself, she can't discern whether or not it is real. That could have been interesting, but the way it's utilized here is still really solid. Mia decides to take things into her own hands and make an escape since David sides with the group. She sneaks out a window and goes for a little rainy day joyride which gets interrupted by the Girl Scout from earlier who noticed that Mia shorted her on the cookies. She winds up crashed in the water in something that resembles the opening shot to the original movie, implying that shit's really about to kick off. Credit where credit is due, this is a damn good looking movie. The lighting, the use of fog, the color grade, and framing are all on point and contribute to this very creepy, grimy feeling. Very well done on the visuals. Well, Mia's day isn't getting any better when the thing pops out of the water and chases her through the woods. Yeah, if you've seen the original, you probably have an idea of where this is going. She gets stuck in a bramble of thorny sticks, which just looks awful and... Eh, 
Yeah, we knew that was gonna happen. The group eventually find her huddled up by a tree and bring her back to the cabin, and in one of the best scenes of the movie, Jane Levy fully sells the paralyzing terror that Mia is feeling right now. I've always loved this scene. The, the way that she looks at David when he first walks in is scary as shit. Seriously, major props to Jane Levy for giving her all to this role. I do think that leaving this last shot as a subtle, quiet still would have been an absolutely chilling way to end the scene instead of making it a jump scare, but it is what it is. While I'm here singing Jane Levy's praises, I should also mention that the rest of the cast is also very good. Her performance is without a doubt the highlight, but with how exhausting a majority of the shoot must have been, the rest of the cast should also be given props. So, Mia's possessed now, and the first thing this Deadite wants to do is get rid of Grandpa. Deadites do seem more like cat people. Fucking psychos. Eric's still showing an interest in the Book of the Dead, and his worries that this is more than withdrawal are all but confirmed when Mia is found in the shower burning her pretty flesh. From this point on, the movie is just a non-stop gore fest of some of the most cringeworthy violence I've ever seen in a movie. Army of Darkness was a pretty tame movie, but those first two Evil Dead films went all in on the bloody craziness, and the 2013 entries pick up right where they left off and delivers a truly grotesque gore fest that, even after all these years, continues to make me squirm in my seat during some moments. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's talk about some of those things. The way the violence is handled in this entry is far more uncomfortable than in past films. The characters here suffer the worst night out of any cast in the franchise and honestly probably have some of the gnarliest deaths I've seen in any movie. Olivia cuts off her own face with a piece of glass and gets brained with a chunk of broken toilet after she attacks Eric with a syringe. Speaking of Eric, he gets the roughest hand dealt by a country mile. This poor dude gets stabbed in the eye with a syringe multiple times, gets his hand nailed to his chest while getting shot with a nail gun, but that's quickly nullified when that hand gets split in half with a crowbar. Natalie has one of the most memorable moments of the movie, in which after being bitten by Mia in the basement, she cuts off her own arm with the bread slicer that was getting a lot more screen time than most bread slicers tend to. She may be a shit character, but props to her for doing what had to be done, even if it didn't work. The violence is handled in a very vicious, disturbing way that makes a lot of these deaths some of the most memorable ones in the franchise, and honestly, in horror movies in general for me. I think this movie has a really interesting way of handling the franchise's DNA, because while the tone is absolutely a massive departure, the spirit of the series is still there. I already talked about that in relation to the sets, but the gore is also handled in a way that respects the roots of Evil Dead's practical makeup and prosthetics. One thing I've talked about as I've gone through this series is the inconsistent look of the Deadites, which is once again true in this movie they look different than they did in Army of Darkness. but. There seems to be some theories as to why that is, so I'm not really going to criticize that, and I can amend some of the previous things I've said about those movies. There are different books, perhaps the different Necronomicons create different Deadites, who knows. Once again, the Deadites take on quite a different appearance, and while there's nothing as cool as some of what we've seen before, I think the designs here fit the tone of the movie pretty well. If looked at on their own, I don't think there's anything particularly interesting about them, but it's from the performances and the way they're shot that I think these Deadites still serve their purpose for the movie. Once again, Jane Levy is fantastic, and there are so many moments that mix her performance with very particular lighting that results in some really creepy and memorable bits. As cool as things like this are, if they showed up in this film, it would feel super out of place and would hurt the movie overall. I do wish there was at least one Deadite that turned into something like bestial. I think that would have gone a long way to making these feel more like Deadites. Overall, I think they work, but one big issue I have with the way they're handled is the lines Deadite Mia has. Why don't you come down here so I can suck your cock, pretty boy? Mia. Mia, you fucking idiot! As I was saying earlier on, the lines that come from the possessed characters are just really juvenile and uninteresting. Just me, you dirty this isn't across the board, and some of what she has to say is genuinely disturbing, in particular a few scenes with David that work really well, but because of the more serious tone of this movie, I would have liked it if more of the lines matched that, because I find a lot of it sillier than I think was intended. If they had been better written, there's a lot of potential for those lines, making the scenes with Mia a lot more disturbing, but they usually just make me laugh. Moving on from the Deadites, I'm really glad that this movie stuck to the philosophy of keeping the effects as practical as possible. The violence is done mostly in camera, 
with some VFX work done in post to heighten things, and the effects are fantastic. There are one or two moments where the digital work is really obvious and distracting, but overall the results are insanely effective and believable. Alright, it's time to talk about the ending. Now's your warning. Eric manages to knock Mia out in the basement before he succumbs to his plethora of injuries, giving David the chance to follow as the book says. He brings Mia outside and buries her in another great scene where the deadite inside her mocks him from within the plastic bag covered in dirt. I know mother hates you now. And she waits for you in hell. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about when I say this movie knows how to compose an effective shot. David's not falling for it though, and it looks like the book was right. He immediately unburies her, and in a sequence stylized as a love letter to movies past, he builds a defibrillator in the hope that even if the Deadeye was killed, she may still be savable. Earlier on, Eric had explained to David that Mia had OD'd and her heart had stopped. I love how this detail is used at the end, and it's just another way this movie effectively uses the addiction subplot that many films would use as nothing more than set dressing. Not that it goes super in-depth on it, but it is used more than it could have been, and I appreciate that. Possession movies are a great way to explore themes like addiction. The way it hurts the people around you, how it causes you to hurt yourself, and how you become a whole different person. It's a good setting for that kind of thing. David's defibrillator worked, and when he goes back inside to get the keys to the truck, Deadite Eric gets the better of him. David, accepting the situation, sacrifices himself for Mia by burning the cabin to the ground with him and Eric still inside. This is when the abomination which has been teased since Eric first found the book comes into play. As cool as this thing is, I will say that it's a little deflating to have this thing be set up so much and that it's just a deadite copy of Mia. As the sky rains blood, the thing crawls out of the ground and an epic final boss battle ensues between it and Mia. It gives one of the most cringeworthy moments of violence in the movie, and also injects some of that sweet, sweet Ash Williams DNA with Mia losing her hand in a badass fucking way. It's a really fun set piece that ends with Mia putting the chainsaw on the thing's face and sawing it in half before walking off into the sun as Ash did before her, or at least as he tried to do. There's also an after credit sequence that shows Mia walking down the road and collapsing before being picked up by a truck driver played by Jack Wally, the actor who played Billy Bob in Evil Dead 2. It's a mid credit scene that's absolutely worth waiting for, and it's followed up by another little treat for fans with Bruce Campbell doing what he does best. Groovy. Groovy indeed, Bruce. Groovy indeed. So, that's the chronologically ambiguous Evil Dead 2013. I remember seeing the trailers for this back in the day, and they scared the ever-loving shit out of me, and it's a movie that I've always enjoyed for its tone, visual flair, and brutal, grimy execution. I'd really love to see more of Mia, and this ending absolutely sets up more for the character. If Bruce Campbell truly will never return as Ash in live action, I would be all in for seeing another movie with Jane Levy reprising her role as Mia and getting to show off her deadite slaying skills. With that, I've now reviewed every film in the franchise, but I'm not quite done with it yet. My next video will be a ranking of all five Evil Dead movies, and it's one that I'm really looking forward to sharing with you. Thankfully, we now know that the streak for Evil Dead continues on to this day. Rise was fantastic, I'm very happy with it, and I'm really looking forward to doing my ranking video on these. Until then, thank you for stopping by Rockland Graves. I hope you've enjoyed your stay.